Good afternoon. Welcome to the Museum of Nebraska History, the Nebraska State Historical Society's monthly brown bag lecture series. My name is Brent Carmack. I'm the Associate Director for Museums and Historic Sites. I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for providing the funding to have these series taped and aired on uh, Lincoln Cable Access Television. Today we are going to hear from Tara Kennedy, who is the paper conservator for the Nebraska State Historical Society. She's going to be talking, to, her title of her talk is Mapping Out Conservation Treatment of the Don Forky Map Collection. Uh, a significant portion of that collection has just went on exhibit here in the Museum of Nebraska History and required some attention from Tara before uh, many of them could be put out. Um, Tara has been with the Society, it'll be three years in July. She came before working for us, she worked for the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. She's got a bachelor's in art history from Northwestern University in Chicago and a master's in library science with an advanced certificate in preservation and conservation studies from the University of Texas at Austin. She uh, can be seen and heard in numerous uh, varieties of things. She's a has a, leads a second life, a double life as a performing actress and, and is in a number of productions around Omaha. She can also be heard on the national public radio show, The Book Guys. Um, she's got a cat and <laughs> she's been a very uh, big help to the historical society and with the map collections along with other paper objects that we have. And with that, let's welcome Tara Kennedy. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Brent, for the introduction and letting everyone know that I have a cat. Yes. <laughs> I thank you all for coming out this afternoon, and I hope that you find this talk interesting and informative. And I would like to mention what a uh, privilege and honor it is to be working on such a distinctive collection of maps that were generally generously donated by uh, the Forky family by Marilyn Forky. So thank you very much, Marilyn. Now, it seems that mapping your way through conservation treatment of a collection, of a sizable collection of maps, could be um, a daunting task. But with the right information and tools, it doesn't take Lewis and Clark to map out treatment of this collection. However, it does require a collections condition survey before we do anything else. So what is a collection survey? Well, items are examined individually or if they are similar in like groups. And if it's a small enough collection as this map collection is, it's about 60 maps, um, each item is examined noting what materials it's made of, the type of paper, the type of media used such as ink or watercolor or graphite, and its current condition. I note any physical problems such as tears or losses, any chemical problems, staining, foxing, any sort of discoloration, or biological problems, such as evidence of insect infestation or mold. And I also note its present housing materials, such as a folder, a uh, mat window, anything like that. Um, I also note the overall condition of the item, and that uh, can range from excellent to poor. Um, its curatorial priority, and in this case, all the maps had equal curatorial priority since it's a, dis it's a distinct collection and an important one. And its treatment priority, it, from needing no treatment at all to needing treatment immediately. And all are assigned to each object or like group of objects. And I also note what type of treatment or rehousing is needed, if any is necessary, and how long it will take to perform the treatment or rehousing. So why do this? Well, um, the survey will provide information on each individual object as well as the overall collection, so I get a better scope of the collection as a whole in each individual item before proceeding with treatment. It also allows prioritization of the maps, what needs my attention first. And also estimates that I, um, that I do can be used to, uh, for future conservation and preventive care project development. Um, priority was especially important in this particular project because I had a limited amount of time to actually treat the maps. So I could only treat a select few before the exhibit was to go up. And the other maps eventually will be treated as time allows. So as the exhibit is up, digital surrogate images, prints, will be replaced 
and the original will be sent to the lab in Omaha where I'll treat it and then put it back up and none will be of the wiser. <laughs> now I'm happy to say that overall the uh, collection was in very good condition. Uh, most of the problems were the uh, poor quality matting and framing that had been done in the past, um, pressure sensitive tape hinges, acidic mat boards and uh, mat windows, and some acidic discoloration. However, some of the maps were in need of special attention before they could go on exhibit. The map that was in the worst condition um, being prepped for exhibit was this map of the United States created by Mitchell, dated 1847. It was in a poor quality map board window which disguised a lot of the map's problems. At least from the front it did. The map was attached with masking tape, which left staining around the perimeter of the map. And you can sort of see it in this picture, but this one will give you a better idea. There is also severe mold damage at the two bottom corners of the map. And unfortunately, the mold had actually changed the texture and the appearance of the paper in those areas and weakened the paper. My best guess as to what happened here, I'll back up so you can see the, oh, sorry. Um, the map was previously folded in half. You can see the crease down the center. And when it was folded, the map got wet at that one corner. And once it got wet and had been sitting around a while, mold developed and damaged that area, those two areas of the map. Eventually, it was taken apart. And when that happened, part of the large loss in this corner ended up in the other corner, stuck to it. So I had to get that part up and put it back in place, which you'll see later on in the slides. So the masking tape paper carrier was removed using Caselli micro spatulas that were heated on a tacking iron. You can see I have my, have my arsenal right there lined up. <laughs> and residual sticky adhesive was reduced using a vinyl eraser and a microspatula. What I try to do is remove most of the bulk adhesive that's still sticky and tacky sitting on the surface of the paper before I uh, resort to any sort of chemical treatment. And the reason I do that is if I applied chemicals straight to the adhesive, what I would probably be doing in most cases is driving the adhesive further into the paper it would cause more staining, it might cause the staining to migrate and worsen and may be more difficult to remove later on. So once I got the tape carrier off and the bulk adhesive off, I tested the surface pH level of the, of the map, which was found to be about 5, which is acidic. And cellulose, which is paper's main ingredient, is happiest at a pH level around 6 to 8. So in order to remedy that, the map was aqueously treated in deionized water. And what deionized water is, is basically w water that has all, everything removed from it. Anything you'd find in regular tap water, such as, uh, f such as fluorides and chlorides and alkaline metals like calcium and magnesium. The water in Nebraska has a natural very high pH of 9 because of all the alkaline metals in the water. And I gradually raised the pH level of the water baths to remove acidic degradation products and impart alkaline metals into the paper to raise the paper's pH level. So now after I've removed all of those elements from that you find in regular tap water to have very clean deionized water, I go back and add metals in a controlled way. I add calcium hydroxide so that I can control the pH gradually of the baths so not to shock the paper if I threw it in a bath if it's at a pH level of 5 and I throw it in a bath of pH of 10, it can freak the paper out. <laughs> Don't want that. <laughs> and while the map was being washed, it was supported on a piece of polyester webbing to give it even support while washing and yet allowing the water to actually get to the paper and also for ease of removal from the bath. So I can actually hold it like that vertically. This is great for tourists. People get terrified when I do this. You're holding that up? It's wet. <laughs> to so the difference in the pH level in the water before washing, and this is not the greatest slide in the world, but 
you can see it's about uh, about seven there. And you can see the green has changed to a lighter shade. So the difference in pH level in the water before washing and after washing shows how acidic products are being sent into the wash water. You can see that it's slightly discolored. So it's out of the into the wash water and out of your paper. The map was bathed until no more discoloration came out of the paper and was invisible in the water, and the pH level of the bath remained unchanged. And to remove the remaining tape adhesive staining, testing was performed on an array of non-aqueous solvents. And it was found that solvents toluene and ethyl acetate worked best for this application. The solvents were applied to the stained areas using an eyedropper and a sable brush. You can sort of see the tape stain going away there. And I used um, the platen you saw on a couple pages, a couple slides back, um, is a suction platen. So what it does is actually pulls a suction through the map to pull the adhesive and residual staining onto a piece of blotter that's behind the object and also to prevent lateral movement of the solvents during application so that it doesn't run into any of the inks or anything that might, any things that the solvent might render soluble. So suction in combination with the action of the fume hood that was running while I was doing this drew off volatile fumes away from me during the treatment process so no conservators were harmed in the treatment of this object. So here's a before detailed shot of the tape stain with the carrier still on, and an after treatment. Here's a before treatment. There's a bit of the tape stain up there. And the tide lines in the moldy areas here were not responding to aqueous treatment or solvents, so they were left as is. But the stain did come out from the tape up there. <coughs> All tears were mended with Japanese tissue and wheat starch paste, which is the standard method in paper conservation for mending tears and filling losses in paper objects. And the corner loss that I mentioned earlier in the talk that was stuck on the opposite corner when it got wet and moldy was removed and placed back in its proper location. So you can see there's, this is the loss from the back. And I got that piece off the other side, and it's back. Still moldy, but it's back. <laughs> Actually, what you see there is not an active mold growth. It's some pigments that are left behind from mold. When mold forms, it actually forms pigments and leaves staining behind. So that's what you're seeing there. So here's the after treatment. <clears throat> excuse me, the front and the back. Another map that needed immediate attention before exhibition was Johnson's map of Nebraska, Dakota, Colorado, and Kansas that dated from 1862. And its pH level was 4, which is very acidic, especially for paper. So it needed to be washed before exhibit to prevent further acidic degradation damage to the paper. And it also suffers from foxing as this back, site, back shot shows. These bits here. If any of you have map collections or paper collections, books at home, I'm sure you've seen this. But remember those foxing spots as you will see them in a whole new light in a moment. So as the slides show, the water was discolored while the object was being washed. And it's also the pH strip shows that it's an acidic level. The yellow you see in the water are acidic degradation products that are being removed from the paper. And I'm happy to say the treatment results for washing this map were fairly dramatic in terms of improving the paper's overall color and flexibility. The less acidic a paper is, the more flexibility it will have especially if the paper is made from cotton and linen pulp rather than wood pulp. Wood pulp is um, basically the base you find in newspaper, for example, or cardboard. 
No. You remember the lovely foxing spots I showed you? Um, they're distinct discolored areas that look like dark brown spots. Like I said, I'm sure you're familiar with them. And this exam that example of foxing is known as bull eye foxing spots since they have distinct centers with rings going outward from the center. And with bullseye foxing, usually the reason behind it is residual metal bits that have been left in the paper pulp and then have corroded due to high um, exposure to moisture or high humidity. And these metal bits could have come from pots that the pulp was mixed in or, or the mixing beaters when the paper pulp was being made and emaciated. Um, masticated, I mean, and uh, or metal that simply somehow fell into the pulp vat. So the pictures you see are photomicrographs of pieces of iron at 40 times magnification that were extracted from the foxing spots on the Johnson map. So you can actually see the rust in here on the bits of iron, which is what's causing the discoloration in the paper. So if you ever wonder what causes foxing, here's one of the culprits. And the other cause of foxing is mold. And that's usually called a snowflake pattern rather than a bullseye because it sort of spreads out and has almost fingers like you'd find in a snowflake, facets. In both cases, foxing results when paper is exposed to high humidity or moisture. So the best way to prevent foxing is keeping your humidity below 55% to prevent metal corrosion or mold germination. <coughs> but you also want to keep it above 35% to prevent desiccation of your paper. Now as a paper conservator, I have some arsenal, uh, no, some things in my arsenal that will actually help in treating foxing in paper. All is not lost. I can perform extraction of the metal inclusions and wash the paper as I did with this map. And I usually reserve that sort of treatment when the foxing spots are not terribly um, distracting in the image area. They weren't readily visible in the map, you may have noticed when you saw the front uh, image. And what it will do is prevent further metal corrosion if I remove the piece of metal so that the foxing spot won't get worse. And if foxing spots do disfigure an image, I can use bleaching techniques to reduce the spots. And special considerations need to be made before uh, attempting this type of treatment. I have to consider the type of paper, the paper pulp it was made with, the media that's used on the item, the type of staining, and the type of foxing. Otherwise, you can end up with terribly disastrous results, such as changing the color of your media completely, and, or darkening the, darkening the paper rather than lightening it. And sometimes, I can't do aqueous treatment. Um, in the example of this watercolor on board, we're stepping away from maps for a moment. Um, I couldn't remove the metal inclusions. They were too far embedded into the board. You can see the little spots in there. And bleaching or washing was out of the question since it's on a thick watercolor board and the media was water sensitive. So really all my options were out. So in this case, I actually in-painted the foxed areas using um, a resin or gum as an isolation layer and then applying um, gouache paint on top of the isolation layer. That isolation layer prevents, um, basically keeps the paint from being, ended up being part of the original, which you don't want. You want to make sure it's a distinct, uh, there's a distinct difference between the work you've done and the work the artist has done. And the result, ta-da, no more foxing spots. Okay, back to maps. Here's a shot before treatment of the Johnson map. And after treatment. So you can see that it's lighter. And if you're wondering what these little pieces of tissue are on top, those are pieces of Japanese tissue, which are actually part of the hinging process as part of the matting and framing process. So a piece of linen tape will be placed across like a T, it's called a T hinge. And Japanese tissue and wheat starch paste are reversible, so when the exhibit is over, all I need is a damp tissue to get that off. I don't have to worry about tape, it won't leave any residual staining, won't uh, be difficult to get off, so as someone who recently went to jail said, it's a good thing. <laughs> so, 
So what can you do to take care of your map collection or any of your paper-based collections, really? Um, storing maps or your paper-based items in acid-free, lignin-free, buffered folders. And in this case, you can have, for something like a map or a newspaper, you can have a polyester window attached, like here, for ease in viewing. I know a lot of packages nowadays just say acid-free, and that's really not enough. You really need them to say acid-free and lignin-free. Lignin is a component of wood that over time, and definitely with exposure to light, can render paper or um, board materials acidic. So that's definitely an important thing to look for when going to find housing materials for your objects. Um, store maps in a stable environment, not the attic, not the basement, common sense. but. Um, you want to store it in a place that's going to be as stable a temperature and relative humidity as possible. So naturally, a living area of your home is best. Um, what I like to stress is, stress is that it's not exactly the exact temperature or the exact relative humidity that you keep it at, but keeping it at a stable one. So, so you don't have wide fluctuations, which can cause stress on paper. Um, but in order to prevent uh, mold growth and induction of foxing, you do want to keep your relative humidity below 55%. It's pretty dry in Nebraska. You guys are okay. You also want to protect uh, your maps from overexposure to light. Light will cause inks and paints to fade and some papers to darken. So keep your light levels on your objects as low as possible. One thing to remember, light damage, fading of inks, fading of paints, irreversible. Once it's gone, it's gone. So. so if you're interested in displaying an object for a long period of time, you might want to consider placing a surrogate up. Color Xeroxes, color photocopies, if they're matted well, you really can't tell the difference. Or you can also get a digital image and have that matted and framed. And for display for your original objects, 100% rag board for matting materials and Japanese tissue and wheat starch paste for hinging, which is what was used for the forky maps in this exhibit. In addition, if you have glazing for your framed objects, you want to have a UV filtering component because UV light is the most damaging to objects. All, air, all levels of light, visible, infrared, or UV are all damaging to paper, but UV is the worst culprit. And that you find a lot of that in fluorescent bulbs and sunlight. And we used a UV filtering polycarbonate on the um, framed objects outside. So, special thanks to Marilyn Forkey for her generous and spectacular donation to the Historical Society and the Historical Society staff for all their preparation of this exhibit and related events. Thank you for your attention. Ah, the question is, if you use the wheat starch paste, how do you keep the bugs out? Well, one thing that bugs really like are, are damp, warm places. So keeping your relative humidity down will help keep the bugs away. Basically, those would be an attractant. So if you don't have an insect problem, you won't suddenly have one if you have wheat starch paste. So basically, you want to make sure your environment is dry enough that the bugs aren't interested in coming inside. So that's why I say don't keep it in the basement because, I mean, excuse me, that's where you usually find bug infestations. Same with the attic. Can you use the glass? Can you buy the glass locally that you're suggesting? Um, the question is, can you buy UV filtering glass locally? You can. You can either get it glass it from many framers offer it. It's actually getting less expensive now. It used to be very expensive, but it's actually coming down in price now. And um, UV filtering plexiglass and now polycarbonate are available. And those actually are more lightweight. So you have, if you have a large poster, for example, the plexiglass makes the piece lighter. So yes, most framers should have that available. Or you may be, should be able to, actually, I don't know if you can buy it like at Hobby Lobby or something, but you may be able to. <laughs> Yes, in the back. I, I didn't catch the significance of the first map that you were showing up there, the map of the United States. The map of the U.S., significance in terms of? 
why, why it's uh, historically significant? Why it was worth preserving? Because it was part of a collection that basically showed the um, the progression of the lands of Nebraska. So it was one in part of a of a bigger collection. So it basically shows it in chronological order. So that's why, and actually for more information, there will be more significant information out in the exhibit if you want specifics. Yes? How much time does it take? So for example, that US map, how long, how many hours did you put in there? How many hours for that one? <laughs> I'm trying to remember. The question was how many hours did I pay, put in for treatment of the maps. In some cases, it doesn't take very long. That one, I think, took, I think it was at least two days of work, so 16 hours. Um, the other map, I think, took less time because I just had to wash it, and that usually doesn't take very long. So it was less than a day. Yes? Once you, <clears throat> when you use the water bath like that, is there any special way that you re-dry them? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the question was how how are they dried? There are several methods of drying. Um, you can air dry them um, on a stack of blotters. I choose to do that initially. I let it dry till basically the top area is the water that's sitting directly on the surface is, go is gone. I put it between a stack of blotters and let it sit for five minutes and then I change out the blotters and put them between blotters and wool felts and plexiglass and weight and leave it a day, change out the blotters again, and then leave it for a week to basically gradually get the moisture out of the paper in a controlled way. Any question? Do you give estimates on the restoration cost of private? I do. The question is, um, do I give uh, estimates for private restoration? I do. We charge $95 an hour for treatment. Yes? Um, many people might not have maps, but they might have other paper things. Uh, are there certain specifics for photographs that you might tell someone basics on photographs or family papers, um, a book, those kinds of things? Um, the, base, um, the question was, um, are there any other tips for storing family papers or photographs and besides maps. The tips I did give actually will be pertinent for any type of paper material. For photographic material, um, the only difference is you don't want to use buffered folders. You just want acid-free, lignin-free folders because the buffered element, which basically means there's an alkaline element, which is a higher pH, can cause some problems in some photographic processes. Um, I'm able to tell which photographic process is what, but sometimes with the general public, they aren't able to tell. So I just use that blanket statement just so there's no harm done to the originals. Sarah? Yes? In my introduction, I neglected to mention that you actually do your work at the Dry Rack Conservation Center. Yes, I forgot to mention. Yes. Could you give us a little description of, of what the Conservation Center is? And, sure. And how people can access your service? Sure. Um, I work for the Gerald R. Ford Conservation Center, which is a regional center, which means um, besides working for the Nebraska State Historical Society collections, I actually work on materials for the general public and surrounding institutions in the area, so any art museum or history museum. And um, we are one of three regional centers west of the Mississippi, and so we're busy. <laughs> but um, yes, we do um, offer um, conservation services to the public. So, if anyone's interested, <coughs> you can give us a call. Um, do yes. you uh, provide, um, if someone wants you to look at, at something, mm -hmm. uh, you evaluate something, you charge for your evaluation time? or we, for, we offer, the question is, um, do we charge for evaluation time? We offer half hour consultations for $30. But that is waived if you choose to do a conservation treatment. Of, uh, what other kinds of conservation occur at the Forest Center? Oh, there you go. That'd be good. Um, we also have, <laughs> thanks, Deb. We also have um, uh, an objects conserv two objects conservators at the Ford Center, so we actually also treat three dimensional objects. 
such as ceramics, glass, metals, wood, and anything like that. So we also yeah. have that option. Guns. Guns, guns swords. Well, you name it, it's, it's been there. <laughs> and fabric. Fabric, well, we don't do a whole lot of that. We don't have a textile conservator. We can do very minor treatments, same with paintings. We don't have a paintings conservator, but we can do some minor treatment. It just depends on what needs to be done. Any more questions? Yes? Is there a step in the process where you analyze the ink or other media that are applied to the paper? And whether it will withstand the treatment? Mm -hmm. The question is, whether is there any analytical work that's done before treatment is pr proceeds? Yes, I didn't mention that. Before I do any sort of aqueous treatment or solvent treatment, I do test the inks and the paper to see if it can actually withstand the treatment. So I actually took um, drops of deionized water or deionized water on a, on a cotton swab and rolled over the inked areas to see if any of them actually offset or bled. And you do it in a very small area, so or a distinct area in a corner where it won't be visible in case it does bleed. But we usually use such little bit of water that it won't be visible. So, if that, does that answer your question? Yes, okay. Yes? I have been hearing about a water leak that took place at a records storage facility here in Lincoln, and I where did you hear that nasty rumor? <laughs> <laughs> so Those nasty reporters. There, there were definitely some water issues there. And right. I had heard that some of the documents were sent to a treatment center in Houston where they freeze dry mm -hmm. to get the moisture out. Mm -hmm. And I understand just that the Historical Society had some things up there. Were they affected? And is that a process that works well, or do you have to do well, I was work on it? I was part of that recovery process, and luckily, um, the staff of the Historical Society reacted quickly enough and in in a, in a wise manner so that um, very few things got damaged. Very few things had to be sent to um, to BMS, the company that's in Dallas. And um, basically, what happened was, as soon as the leak occurred, staff was notified, and it was a leak that was coming from the ceiling. So all objects were covered with plastic so that the water didn't get onto the objects. We got fans in there just to keep the air circulating to prevent mold growth. And also we got dehumidifiers in there to take up the excess water. And also there was a uh, facility coming to clean the actual building to clean up the excess water and this wet ceiling tiles. So actually we got a lot of the moisture out of the area. So that basically helped a great deal in um, having very few items that actually needed freeze drying treatment. So, and freeze drying treatment is very effective for some materials. In the case of public records, that was very, that was very useful, so. Are you concerned with the mold that might be establishing itself in the walls? Um, the fact that we got the building, usually it takes, I think there's a germination period usually for mold of about 48 to 72 hours. So we reacted quickly enough and got the moisture out of there fast enough that I'm not very, I'm not concerned about that. So, like I said, the fact that everyone reacted quickly and you know used we used common sense helped a great deal. Yay, historical society. <laughs> Anyone else? Anybody else want water? <laughs> <laughs> I feel so selfish. <laughs>